to date. Well, let's look to the Lord in prayer, asking his spirit's tutelage in our study of scripture this morning. Father, thank you for the privilege that's ours. We think of some of the saints over in Ukraine who some of them can't even gather in houses of worship because they've been blown up. We think of some of our persecuted brethren in various countries around the globe that have to be wise as serpents, harmless like doves, in choosing different times to meet unless they die for their faith. Lord, we ask that you would tenderize our hearts, strip away any callousness where we carry on as business as usual. Help our worship to never turn into empty ritual. We pray for any in our midst or those that might be joining us that are, have not come all the way to Christ. There may be those that sit in these chairs week after week and they understand the gospel but have not responded and placed their faith in Christ alone. God, in your kindness, you bring people to repentance and so we'd ask you to continue to do that. For any here that you'd lighten, enlighten their eyes to their, their sinfulness, the judgment that hangs over them, and the free offer of grace through Christ, who says, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Lord, there is no rest like that eternal rest, knowing that our sins are forgiven, our eternal home in heaven in your presence is secured. And what a new caliber of life you give us, living in this fallen, sinful world, that we can live above the situations, because we're citizens of a different land. Meet with us now through the scriptures as you speak to us. Conform us to your image, we pray in your name. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, and join me back in that little minor prophet of Hosea. This is our third week in studying Hosea. We've introduced the book. We've gone through the first chapter. We ended on kind of a high note in the last couple of verses of chapter one last week. Today I'd like to preach to you a sermon that I've entitled, The Prophet's Word of Purging and Promise for His Prostitute and Progeny. Hosea 2, we'll be studying verses 2 to 23. Now as I'm getting older and I'm realizing that not everyone's had the same experiences and everything changes. I'm, though we have homeschooled all of our kids on the product of public school system, and I'm grateful for some of those that poured into my life. I, I was telling somebody recently, I forget who it was in our church, that uh, uh, I had this English teacher who she said to us, she tolerated her juniors, but she thought she was really there to get the seniors ready for college. And we were going back over stuff that many people don't, aren't even taught, let alone remember. So as I was quizzing this last week as to who's read the Scarlet Letter, that was uh, a necessity. It was an imperative that I'm not able to find the word right now. I'm kind of stumbling for it. But, um, you know, the Scarlet Letter is a work of historical fiction by Nathaniel Hawthorne that was published in 1850. It's set in the Puritan Massachusetts Bay Colony during the years 1642 to 1649. In this novel that I had to read, and uh, as I checked with some of my homeschool kids at home, some have read it and some haven't, so uh, we know what to keep them in line with. But it's a story of Hester Prynne, who conceives a daughter with a man whom she was not married and then struggles to create a new life of repentance and dignity. Containing a number of religious and historic allusions, the book explores themes of legalism and sin and guilt. The Scarlet Letter was one of the first mass-produced books in the United States, popular when it was first published, and is considered a classic work of American literature. And suppose you're one of those that didn't read it. Let me just get you up to sp sp speed very briefly. In Puritan Boston, Massachusetts, and no, if you ever accuse me of having 
a Boston accent just because I parked my car in the dooryard. Um, Maine is very different from Massachusetts. So you all need to be schooled on this. Puritan Boston, Massachusetts. A crowd gathers to witness the punishment of Hester Prynne, a young woman who's given birth to a baby of unknown paternity. Her sentence requires her to stand on the scaffold for three hours exposed to public humiliation and wear a scarlet A for the rest of her life. And as I was reading this as a young person, I was either 16 or 17 year olds, and it's like, get real. Are you really going to do this to the woman? Hester approached the scaffold. Many of the women in the crowd angered by her beauty and quiet dignity. And when commanded and cajoled to name the father of her child, Hester refuses. Your public shaming, social stigma of having a child outside of wedlock, it's meant to extract a response of sympathy to kind of tone it down a little bit that adultery is really not, or excuse me, fornication. Yeah, I guess she was married, so yeah, it is adultery. Uh, I don't care what the sexual sin is. We want to pretty it up and make it smell better. Nothing is more shameful than a person lying against their covenant vows in holy matrimony. Those who said to their spouse, I've forsaken all others and hold myself unto you until death parts us. It's a shameful act. There's no way to pretty it up. And there is no more, no better illustration, no grander object lesson for God through the inspiration of the Spirit of God as he commanded Hosea, Mary a woman of harlotry. Even if she was pure when they got married, eventually she's going to play the harlot. This was a real account in Holy Scripture. We interpret Scripture literally unless the Scripture drives us to take it otherwise. It's the normal sense. Hey, you've got a prophet marrying a prostitute. You know, with... Hester Brynn, she, she felt no shame, though it was a shameful act. She felt no guilt, though she's guilty and has the child to prove it. Israel is shocked in horror as the mouth drops down, as the prophet writes to them and preaches to them, that you, Israel, are a harlot. No way to pretty it up. You've been unfaithful to your covenant vows with Yahweh. It's meant to go down sideways as you read the story. Yahweh confronts Israel, his unfaithful wife, for seeking the Baals, or what we'll read about in chapter 2, her lover's. Because she's looking to all the little G gods of the nations all around her, playing the harlot, saying, oh, Baal, you've given us this great agricultural gain. No, it was Yahweh, the creator God. You are not polytheistic Israel. You're the worshipers of the one true God who made heaven and earth. Would you... Read the text with me as I follow along as I read for us. Hosea chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. Contend with your mother, contend. For she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. So those, these are the words of Hosea. Hosea in the account represents Yahweh. Saying she's not my wife anymore. Let her put away her harlotry from her face, her adultery from between her breasts, or I will strip her naked and expose her on the day when she was born. I will also make her like a wilderness, make her like desert land and slay her with thirst. Also, I will have no compassion on her children because they are children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. 
She who conceived them has acted shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She'll pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them. And she will seek them, but will not find them. Then she will say, I'll, I'll go back to my first husband, for it is better for me then than now. For she does not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the oil, and lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I'll take back my grain at harvest time, my new wine in its season. I'll also take away my wool, my flax, given to cover her nakedness. Then I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one will rescue her out of my hand. I'll also put an end to all her gaiety, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her festival assemblies. I'll destroy her vines and fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field will devour them. I'll punish her for the days of the Baals, when she used to offer sacrifices to them and adorn herself with her earrings and jewelry, and follow her lovers so that she forgot me, declares the Lord. These are serious, sobering words from Yahweh. People want to castigate Yahweh as, boy, you're a pretty big stickler, huh? It's like, no, he's a holy God, and uh, he's married to a sinful people, a sinful nation. And as bleak and dark and dank as the first half of chapter 2 is, notice the, the upshot of of the promise here, beginning in verse 4. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, bring her into the wilderness, and speak kindly to her. Then I will give her her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She'll sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. See, she forgot where she'd come from, took it for granted how good and powerful Yahweh was. Verse 16, it will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you'll call me Ishi and will no longer call me Bali. For I'll remove the names of the Baals from her mouth so that they will be mentioned by their names no more. In that day, I will also make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, the creeping things of the ground. I'll abolish the bow and sword and war from the land and will make them lie down in safety. I'll betroth you to me forever. Yes, I'll betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and in compassion. I'll betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you'll know the Lord. It'll come about in that day that I will respond, declares the Lord. I'll respond to the heavens and they will respond to the earth. And the earth will respond to the grain, to the new wine, to the oil, and they will respond to Jezreel. I will sow her for myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who were not my people, you're my people. And, will say, and they will say, you are my God. I think that as we finish the reading of Holy Scripture here, you know why there's an insert in your bulletin for tea time this afternoon of what we teach about the millennial reign of King Jesus because that is what Hosea is speaking of here where God is the first promise keeper. Let's look first of all at the details of coming purging judgments. The details of coming purging judgments in verses 2 to 13. While much of the previous words of chapter 1 were to Hosea's unfaithful wife and children, a, a, a literal historic event. We practice historical exegesis here. These are, are real people. They're in real times with real sandals and real horrific events in a sinful fallen world. Even when Yahweh tells his prophet Hosea, go marry a prostitute. God deals with her and her children in the first chapter. Back in chapter 1 and verse 2 told us, why God did this. Why this grand object lesson? When he says in, in chapter 1, verse 2, go take to
to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry? For, his purpose statement, the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaken the Lord. Hosea, excuse me, Gomer pictures Israel while Hosea pictures God. Real people, real events to illustrate in real time. The land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaken Yahweh. So though the prophet himself was involved in a real situation, he represents Yahweh. We start off this section of Hosea 2 with an invitation to repent. If you've taken notes, this would be uh, letter A in your outline that's not there because I didn't have enough room to put a full outline for you. I'll give you the main points on the back of your bulletin. So letter A, this is an invitation to repent in verses 2 and 3. Now, it's been uh, uh, last Monday, the Reardon family celebrated our six-year anniversary of being out here in Southern Oregon. Last month, no, I guess it wasn't last month. Last month was September. What are we in? Are we in October? Yeah. So in August, after all the COVID crackdown stuff happened, uh, my mother's side of the family, the Halls, had the family reunion I used to go to in the fall when I was in the area. It was a great time. You could see Aunt Sally, and you could, uh, at times, I would play the auctioneer, because all, all the family members would bring some homemade goodies and stuff you really don't want anymore, and we'd have a family auction so that we could sponsor a scholarship in the local high school. It was a fun time. I know some people's family reunions weren't delightful times, but I think back of this with fond affection. I recall family reunion... Uh, being a, a good time. We ended chapter one with a family reunion. A glorious, upbeat note in which that previous chapter ends where, um, you know, and, and actually verse one of our chapter today. Say to your brothers, Ami, you're my friends, and your sisters, Ruhama, mercy. Because the story started off with not my people and no mercy. So this is a, a cool reunion that um, ends in verse 1 of chapter 2. Speak to your brothers, O my people, and to your sisters, O show mer shown mercy. And right after a jubilant command to welcome your family... The mood of chapter 2 darkens abruptly. There's an ironic twist here in the, in the story. As the children are called to testify against mom. Has she been a good mom? Has she been a faithful wife? Uh -uh. Contend with her is the beginning of verse 2. Reeb means to strive, to quarrel, to attack, or to complain. Twice it's repeated. Rebuke is how NIV renders it. I think the ESV kind of tones it down. Plead with mom. Okay. I think that's a little anemic in the context of which Hosea is writing here. The Hebrew root of the word contend is used typically in the law court and describes God's covenant lawsuit against his sinful people. Holy God, sinful people. God entered into covenant, promise with his people. There are various promises that are hinging on Israel's faithfulness. But there's others that hinge only on God's fidelity. Praise God that when we're unfaithful, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. You know, back in Exodus 23, or excuse me, Ezekiel 23, would be one of the many lawsuit times, this courtroom scene, um, Ezekiel 23, where there is spiritual infidelity. The word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel says, in verse 1 of chapter 23. 
saying, Son of man, there are two women, the daughters of one mother. They played the harlot in Egypt. They played the harlot in their youth. There their breasts were pressed, and there their virgin bosom was handled. Their names were Ohola, the elder, and Oholaba, her sister. And they became mine, God says. They bore sons and daughters, and as for their names, Samaria is Ahola, and Jerusalem is Holaba. Ahola played the harlot while she was mine. So lest you think that Hosea is the only story that talks about God's treacherous, unfaithful, whoring people. Ezekiel chapter 23 describes the spiritual infidelity of Israel and Judah, just like the group that Hosea is called to prophesy against. Two sisters to convey the gravity of sin in Judah. One mother refers to the United Kingdom, while two women refers to the divided kingdom, the northern and the southern. Ahola, meaning her own tabernacle, as she had her separate dwelling place apart from the temple, represents Samaria. In the northern kingdom, Jeroboam had set up worship that God rejected. Aholabah, my tabernacle is in her, represents Jerusalem where God did establish worship. But there are too many high places. Children of Israel are called to bring an indictment here in our text of Hosea 2 to contend with their mother, just like what Ezekiel was doing. Prosecute mom. In essence, the individuals calling the nation to turn. I wish there be a little bit more of that or a whole lot more of that in our own nation. Calling them to accountability. Soon they'll be called further in this legal proceeding to the divine dispute, the case, later on in Hosea 4 and Hosea 12. But you know, this is a call to repentance. When he says, contend with your mother, contend. And he calls her to put away her harlotry from her face and her adultery. Repentance is called. You know, whether it's disciplined by the Lord, Hebrews 12, or through his church, Matthew 18, Discipline is always unto restoration. That's the intent. Churches that take sin serious want to see sinners reconciled with God. When God takes his true children to the woodshed, he does so for their holiness. Paul tells us that it's God's kindness that leads to repentance in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Mom, whose own children are contending with her, ought to have led to repentance. What else does she need to convince her? Or what about you, dear friend? Puritan Richard Sibbs encouraged believers to humbly trust the Lord fully knows just what is needed to help us repent because we're so obstinate, we're slow to reconcile. He says, let us lament our own perversity and say, Lord, what a heart have I that needs all this, that none of this could be spared. God, by his spirit, convinces us deeply, setting our sins before us and driving us to a standstill. Then we'll cry out for mercy. Conviction will breed contrition, and this leads to humiliation. Therefore, desire God that he would bring a clear and a strong light into all the corners of our souls and accompany it with a spirit of power to lay our hearts low because our hearts are high. What more does she need to convince her? So there's the complaint. Witness to your mom against her unfaithfulness and her whoring ways. This is all setting things up for a grand divorce in divorce court. And yet Yahweh sets forth the desire not for separation, but for reconciliation. It's amazing. This is the overtop, the lavish grace and goodness of God 
It's love beyond degree. God does not respond as sinful man does. Amen? You know, he's taken the high road, the way of sovereign sacrificial love, which invites repentance rather than divorcement. Because the marriage covenant had been violated, but God did not end the relationship. Again, the second half of our text will attest to that. That's why he's holding out before her in, in, in verse 3. Like, like if she doesn't repent, if, if she doesn't put away her harlotry and her adultery, God says, I'll, I'll strip her naked. I'll expose her as on the day when she was born. You know, in verse 3, he's promising to take everything away. It's all on the line. And though the I, the personal pronoun, is Hosea, remember, this is Yahweh speaking. Such humiliation was the ultimate form of punishment in the ancient Near East. You get caught, you get stoned. We were just a moment ago in... Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16, 37. Therefore, behold, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure. This is what Yahweh is saying to Israel. Even though all those whom you loved and all those whom you hated, so I will gather them against you from every direction and expose your nakedness to them that they may see all your nakedness. This is shame. There's no way to pretty it up. It smells just as rank as it is. Sin is just as heinous as the Bible teaches it is. You know, and as Israel was whoring with the nations and their little G-gods, their Baals, at their Asherah and high places, they were bringing reproach. God said, I'll bring reproach upon your lovers, the nations all around you. Return you naked just like the day you were born. There was a time that Israel was not Israel. They were not a nation when they went into Egypt. And God brought them out by the hundreds of thousands, a great nation that he made for the praise of his own great name. And they forgot it all. You know, this should have brought to their memory nationally of the deprivations in the wilderness as she suffered the chastening of her sin and the bodies that died and littered the wilderness for 40 years before they ever reached the land of promise. It was a barren desert area, and God said, I'm going to take you back there. You know, learn your ways. Remember, what was it, four weeks ago when we were getting ready to go to the Old Testament in Hosea, and we were in 1 Corinthians 10, where Paul is admonishing us that New Covenant idolaters can learn a lot from Old Testament saints. Learn from Israel. You follow the same ungodly path and her whoring ways. Don't think that your results are going to be any different than hers. So God's holding out that you're, you're about to lose everything here. All the pleasure of sin for a season was meant to prick her conscience and draw her home. God protected her at the time she was in the wilderness but she'd become like that parched and desolate land unless she returned to him in biblical repentance. So there is this desire for reconciliation, not separation. And the threat of punishment is merely an intermediate step in Yahweh's pursuit of his wife's repentance. It's all on you, babe. This is not a, a chauvinistic display of rage and violence. But this going back and forth between the threat of punishment and the hope of restoration. This is Yahweh's struggle, his anguish to, to vindicate justice and yet show mercy. So if letter A of our outline is an invitation in verses 2 and 3 to repent. Look at verse 4 again. I'll have no compassion on her children because they are children of harlotry. God, God's not just quarreling with his bride, now he's quarreling with his children that he called to witness against her nation. The agents of indictment are turned into those that are indicted in verse 4. Her whoring ways will 
even affect those most precious to her? Should she continue to sell out to her own desires? Is this not reality in years in my life with these false narratives that man sells to himself? Well, my sin's not affecting anyone else. Bull. Affects all around us. We've got a courtroom scene here. Called the children as witnesses against their own mother. And mom is found an unfit guardian of her children. Yet they too have the heart and the habits of mom. The apple fall, doesn't fall too far from the tree, does it? Think of what Israel did to her testimony among the nations. Oh, you guys are the Yahweh worshipers. That, just that one God, Yahweh. Those whom we were shaken in our booties because we heard what happened in Egypt land and every enemy of Yahweh he decimated as you trudged through their land. And yet you're coming to us for solace and substance. They played the hypocrite. Aren't you those that God brought out of Egypt with a strong hand and Caused to shake. He must be very glorious and fulfilling and strong if you look into us for support. You know, the sinful heart of man continues ever since Genesis 3 onward. That is why Paul could say to us in the sermon four weeks ago, from the testimony of Israel to the church, if any man thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. Israel's us. No, the church is not Israel. But it, this is the grand object lesson. That man is doing what man has always done. Whether she be God's bride, Israel, or his body, the church. Children had been lulled into thinking that they're not as guilty as mom. It was probably a year and a half ago that we preached on Ezekiel 18 where... There was a proverb in the day, the children who are in bondage land are accusing mom and dad. We're here because of your sin. Well, you know what? Parents are going to own their own sinfulness and children are going to own theirs. We can't blame each other. And so he talks to the children here. They're indicted. Rather than blame shifting and being self-deceived about their innocence, Hosea's audience must realize that a time of judgment is coming quickly and they will no longer be shown mercy. It's sobering. The prospect of forgiveness is offered to Israel not as an unconditional promise to be abused, but as an urgent opportunity to be embraced so that restoration might follow rather than judgment. Rebellious mother... And children stand in solidarity, and so do we. Here she flaunts her shame in verse 5. She's played the harlot who conceived them, has acted shamefully. You know, she's dwelling on sin on her bed, burning in her lust for her false lovers that promise pleasure, but every single time deliver pain and emptiness and remorse, and shame. The idols of bread, and water, and wool, and flax, and oil, and drink. So as she's running after her lovers, who would give gifts to her, so Israel was running after the false gods of the surrounding nations. She's depending on the nations for her food, for her water, her wool, her linen, her oil, and her drink in their trade arrangements. You could think about Israel's spiritual apostasy from, from Deuteronomy to Judges? How about the, fact, uh, the idol factory of your own, own heart, beloved? What have you been chasing in your own double-mindedness? Pornography? Alcohol? Praise of men? Your BFF that stands in the place of God. Gomer's blinded. She's looking upon others as providing all her basic needs which could 
only be rightfully attributed to Yahweh. As the fountain of all blessing, all goodness, all glory, no good thing does he withhold from them who walk uprightly, not the bales that his apostate people were pursuing. And so there is this promised frustration of her idolatry in verses 6 to 13. Aren't you glad that God commits himself, he loves his bride so much that he's committed to frustrating our idols. That we find our rest and our refuge in him. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run to it and they are safe. Not the names of the nations all around us. In the world's way of doing things. Notice how he, he, he promises to hedge up her way with thorns. He's going to build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. I used to know how to find my way to my lovers. I can't find them anymore. God's frustrating her. It begins with that vivid portrayal of God's judgment on unfaithful Israel. He'll keep her lovers from her by blocking her path. You know, in verse 7, you can kind of see her in this tizzy. She's chasing her tail. She'll pursue her lovers, but she won't overtake them. You know, trying to gratify pleasure like us believers, trying to find pleasure in the sin we used to love before Christ. While we spurned his righteousness, you repented, you placed your faith in Christ alone, and all of a sudden, there's this big upheaval where your affections change position, the sin you used to love, now you hate, and the righteousness you used to spurn, now you love. Now, how do we practice this? So God is frustrating her idolatry. Idols will never satisfy, even though that's what they promise and the false narratives that our flesh preaches us to, to us every time in our temptation. We need to learn how to, how to run to the Lord as our rock, our refuge, our deliverer. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God in what? Enjoy him, not our idols forever. You know, it, it seems she kind of comes to herself in the text, kind of like the prodigal son and recognizing the pig slot for what it really is. Remember the, the, the account of the, the prodigal son? As he comes to himself, he's eating pig slop and he says, dad's slaves have it better than I do here in this land of my rebellion. All the sinful choices that resulted from it. So she recognizes here that, you know what? At the end of verse 7, it was better for me then than it is now. The grass is always greener where? Over the septic tank. It's a bunch of lies. It's a bunch of false fantasies. Promises pleasure, delivers pain every time. So she recognized it was better to follow Yahweh than go off on her own. But let's be a little careful here. Is she being pragmatic? Was it worldly sorrow rather than real repentance with the fruit that authenticates it? Was it a, sorry, I got caught? Oops. You know, verse 8 suggests that Israel has not only deliberately forgotten Yahweh and seeking her lovers, but recalls his past gifts enough to seek them, though not him in favor of Baal. Notice this, verse 8, for she, she does not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the new wine, the oil, and lavished on her silver and gold, which they used. So she does know it, but she's forgotten it. God said this would happen. When you get in this land of plenty, you're going to get this idea in your head that, look at me, by my brains and my brawn. She's so calloused and forgetful. How did she start off? She started off as a theocracy. She was a weird nation. She didn't have any human king upon the throne. She had Yahweh, her God, to whom she owed her allegiance. Ruled by Yahweh, who would make them a nation, but they wanted kings like their neighboring nations who became their lovers. All these political alliances were a religious choice with spiritual consequences as their hearts were led after the Baals. 
So it wasn't just these physical allegiance. It was a religious act. Okay? Fine, you made your bed, you can sleep in it. Verse 10, I'll uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers. No one will rescue her out of my hand. Literally, uncover her shame. Shame is nablot, means a withered state. Israel would be withered because God would withhold his bounty, just like he had done in the wilderness. You'd think she'd learn her lesson. So the language of shaming just increases in the text. That's why we let off in our sermon today with the scarlet letter. No way to get rid of the shame, uh, to, to tone down the ugliness of the shame. And it suggests an act of sexual exposure. You know, and I doubt in a day in which young people don't respect closed doors, in which parents haven't taught shame and cover up in modesty, that we really get the, uh, the color here of the language. Because as soon as sin enters the picture in the divine narrative, every time there is nakedness, shame is attached. Save one time, husband and wife. You know, and the church doesn't blush enough, especially on this day of free sex and no consequences. If you're pregnant, just murder your child in the womb. Come to Planned Parenthood. We will take care of it for you. Shameful. And finally, God brings it to specificity in verse 13. I will punish her for the days of the Baals. That's the issue right there. It's not Baal who gave the niceties of your earrings and your jewelry. Like the false prophets of Baal learned up on Mount Carmel, they thought, ha, let's have after this Elijah. And whichever God answers by fire, let's let him be God. And they can't even get Baal's attention. They're, they're cutting themselves with lances and the prophets taunting them. Maybe you yell a little bit louder because your God is sleeping. You know, it would seem that verses 2 to 13 should be the final nail in the nation's coffin. As she has forsaken Yahweh, she has played the harlot. She's worthy of being thrown off and divorced. According to the Mosaic Law. Notice the reassurance of future restoration, verses 14 to 23. You know, this corresponds with the ending of the previous chapter. Aren't you glad that there is mercy, not just judgment? It begins with this conjunction, therefore. You say, okay, Pastor Parker, we got all these verses, 14, 23. Are you really going to go word by word? No, I'm not. So just relax. We're here until midnight anyways, right? Therefore, or that being so, what being so, verses 2 to 13, launches the shock of this love beyond degree. Because there is not just unfaithful, sinful people. There is faithful, holy God who doesn't deny himself. He binds himself, his character, to his oath. This is the second mind-blowing reversal in the chapter. A breaking in of God's unfathomable mercy. Though there is at best partial fulfillment at the return, when she finally comes home from Babylon in captivity, it is not in detail what God has promised. Real and complete fulfillment in literal detail can only be the glorious millennial reign. In contrast, I I love me my Calvin, my French theologian, he's just long, and Kyle and other commentators who see the the promises given to others fulfilled in the church, the text gives no hint that when they return from the woodshed event of captivity, that in detail this is the fulfillment to what God has promised. Normal practice of interpretation 
is giving the sense of a straightforward reading calling for the blessings of Israel to be taken just as literally as the punishment set therein in verses 6 to 13. We don't want to give just the gist. It's good enough. You know, a consistently literal interpretation, whether you're in Genesis or Revelation or the Minor Prophets, you don't have to change your handling of Scripture. You handle it all the same way, just a straightforward reading, unless it forces you and shows you the figures and the types. So there's, first of all, this renewed courtship in verses 14 to 17. I'll allure her. You know, it's used in other contexts with meanings ranging from persuade to seduce. These are the words of Yahweh. Are we really reading this correctly how you are? Actually, Jeremiah boldly accuses God of doing, doing this to him and calling him into his prophetic ministry in Jeremiah 20, verse 7. Jeremiah didn't... Uh, Mother didn't give birth to him and right from the womb say, okay, I've been consecrated from the womb. I'm going to be a prophet of God. God pushed this on him. God allured him into the ministry. And here, rather than Yahweh divorcing her, he commits himself to wooing her back to him as her only truly faithful husband. Husbands, you've taken notice here of how husbandry is done. You know, he'll, uh, Hosea tells us he'll, he'll bring her to the wilderness and speak kindly to her. Literally, speak upon her heart as the Legacy Standard Bible translates it. He speaks kindly and tenderly. Again, husbands, are you taking note of what it looks like to woo your wife and continue to date her through, through the decades? I'll give her her vineyards, verse 15 from there. The valley of Achor as a door of hope. She will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. You know, she'd lost the wonder of it all, and she's going to be reminded how awesome it is for this marital union with Yahweh. This is the husband of all husbands. God goes on to say that you will call me Ishi, no longer Bali. You'll call me husband, not master or my Baal. In this day, Israel will be spiritually revived as her heart is turned to her Messiah and recognizes, you know, as as Zechariah mentions, that she's going to weep on him as one weeps for an only child when she recognizes, we not only missed our Messiah, we crucified our Messiah. This is Hosea's unique presentation, different, same reality spoken of, though, different terms than Zechariah. When Zechariah says, I'll pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace so that they'll look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. In that day they will call him husband Ishi. I'll remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, verse 17. It seems to be voluntary compliance on their part. Notice the initiation by God. He's the one that enabled the change in the first place. Sovereign God all over the text of Scripture. He removes the names of the Baals. They'd been clearly instructed in the very beginning not to have any God be, besides him. How, does, how do the ten words begin, the ten commandments? No other gods before me. Matter of fact, you want to multiply your wives, they'll draw your hearts away from him. Ask Solomon. That's exactly what happened. You act like the nations around you, you're going to be worshiping their gods. So there's this renewed courtship. There is restoration and abolition of war in verse 18. I'll I'll make a covenant for them with the beast. Notice it's not with them, but with the beasts, the birds, the creeping things. I'll abolish the bow and the sword. Those are the two instruments of war so that they can lie down in safety and peace. So here's another eschatological phrase of in that day, verse 18. We'd seen that back in the previous chapter. With the context set with this phrase, millennial parallels 
galore arise from the pages. He establishes a covenant. Literally, he cuts a covenant with the creatures that he'd originally placed under the vice regency of man. Man was to rule, man was to subdue creation. And when man fell into sin, God cursed the earth that man walked on. And he reverses the curse. You know, he reverses that curse. You know, when I... What, it's coming up close to two years since we sold our last house. We had 10 raised bed gardens. When I gave up gardening, it's because the voles took over my gardens. I'm no longer going to exercise this green thumb. I'm going to spend a few extra bucks on organic veggies in the store. We moved to our new house, no property to maintain, and now we've got uh, the war waged with the river rats and the digger squirrels and the packing down three-quarter minus so that they won't keep on burrowing holes everywhere. It's a fight with creation all the time. What a glorious day. Not only is lamb going to lay down with lion, but God will establish. We're praying for peace all the time, and there's not going to be peace until the Prince of Peace rules in his millennial reign. And he breaks the bow and the sword. Can you comprehend the prayers of our brethren in Ukraine? Currently, during the war, as they pray for peace, which as they have their theology straight, they know that it'll be, it'll be temporary, it will be um, not perfect. Maranatha, even so come Lord Jesus. Hasten the day. There's a pledge to marital fidelity, verses 19 and 20. I'll betroth you to me forever. I'll betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and love and kindness and compassion. I'll betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you'll know the Lord. Notice those three verbs. In, in verse 19 is what, what we refer to as prophetic perfects. I will, I will, I will. And the promises are viewed as already done, though they are future. When we're talking about the promise-keeping God, even though he hasn't fulfilled, it's as good as already done. Because there is not a promise he hasn't fulfilled and anything that is not fulfilled will be fulfilled with the same certainty of those that have been fulfilled. It's a done deal. That's a divine commitment. In the ancient Near East, betrothal is this renewed marriage which will be forever. God never reneges on his promises. She'll be betrothed forever, no period of estrangement like in Old Testament times. And how important is this faithfulness to fulfill the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David? It's been said that promises are only as dependable as the individuals that make them. So what about you, dear Christian? You claim to have come to faith in Christ, and your new identity is a truth-teller. Where your word is your bond. So as we continue to study Hosea, in this chapter that speaks of purging, it also speaks of promise for Israel. While undeniable punishment awaits them for covenant treachery and unfaithfulness in her whoring ways, as seen in Gomer, so the lavish grace and faithfulness of Yahweh, pictured by the prophet that still awaits his fulfillment of promised blessings in the millennial reign of Jesus. And just icing on the cake here, you've got full family fruitfulness. Notice it. Verse 21, it will come about in that day, I'll respond, declares the Lord, I'll respond to the heavens and they will respond to the earth. The earth will respond to the grain, the new wine to the oil. And they'll respond to Jezreel. Ooh, we saw that name back in chapter 1. Speaking of scattering and judgment, I'll sow her for myself. So I'm going to do another Jezreel, God says, and not scatter you, but I am going to scatter your seed and plant it deeply in the land. The nuance of the word. I'll sow her for myself in the land. I'll have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, and they will say, you're my God. So he initiates and graciously acts upon these previously apostate people. 
They'd sought out fertility gods like the polytheistic nations in hopes of bountiful crops. You want bountiful crops? Go God's way. He'll bless your socks off. Just worship and obey him solely. They didn't understand it. They didn't see it. But they were called to live by faith. And so God now demonstrates he alone controls his nature so as to bestow blessing over their obedience by faith. And his bounty is so full-orbed, he not only established a faithful forever marriage with Gomer, but notice the family, Jezreel. He's the first child, which means to sow, which God did sow in judgment. As he dispersed his people into captivities, but then in that day, in mercy, he will sow in the sense of planting them back in the promised land. And there the land will be abundantly pro productive. If you wanted the produce with the, the whoring ways of the nations around you and their bales, it doesn't come, doesn't come that way. And verse 23 poetically brings back those other two chillins. There'll be compassion and mercy for lo ruhamah, no mercy. And the third completes the picture. Lo ami, not my people, will be my people, and they will confess that you are my God. Reversal and intimate relationship reestablished in the future. You know, we opened up with the story of the scarlet letter. With Israel, we wear the scarlet letter A, adulterer. And like Hester Prynne, Many times have no sense of shame or decorum. And even if we wear the A under the clothes of the guilty minister so that nobody could see, because we like to hide in secrecy and cover up, sin just loves that. Oh, let's cover it up in worldly sorrow and put a band aid on it as if it were what God required. We must repent, be restored. All have transgressed. And Christian, be suspect of your own sanctification and repentance. Oh, that there'd be a greater sensitivity towards sin, a deeper repentance, and, and a breathing of gospel fresh air as you do the, the, the biblical confession, the biblical repentance, and receive the pardon and the forgiveness, the promise of pardon, that air of forgiveness. Adore the covenant keeper who is all wise, completely sovereign, and good all the time. Don't forget it. There was relational treachery. There was misplaced gratitude. And there was spiritual amnesia for the house of Israel. Recall with them, Deuteronomy 4.9, only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Because the scary or the saddest verse of all the Old Testament comes in the book of Ju uh, Judges, that there arose a generation that knew not God. Don't forget God and don't forget to teach others of him. Recall as well, watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who bought, brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And remember that when you've eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he's given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord. And when all that you have multiplied, then your heart will become proud. You'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you power to make wealth. Would you pray with me? Father, help us to be schooled by Israel as New Covenant believers. There is so much to learn from you of their experiences and their admonitions and their instructions. Lord, as that great reformer Calvin said, our hearts are a factory of idols and we are pumping out ours fast and furious substitutes, empty, vain substitutes rather than finding our fulfillment in Christ and Christ alone. Change this about us. Give us a deeper repentance, a more consistent pursuit of you alone. For your praise and glory we ask it. Amen.